Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us for this event tonight. I'm Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs, and I'm proud to represent California's 53rd Congressional District here in San Diego. As the youngest member of Congress from California and the second youngest woman in Congress, it was an easy decision for me to join the Future Forum, a caucus of 50 of the youngest members of Congress. Last month, I was elected as one of the caucus's vice chairs, and I'm excited to be working with my colleagues to address the issues facing my generation and future generations, and to better engage young Americans in the work of Congress. Last month, Congressman Soto hosted the first of our Future Forum town halls in his district in Florida, talking with local students about COVID relief and the American Rescue Plan. So much of our work in the Future Forum is centered around the issues that uniquely affect young Americans. Climate change, gun violence, new technologies, college affordability and the student debt crisis. As I've said, it's our generation and future generations that are going to be living with the consequences of the decisions we're making longer than most. So we should have a seat at the table when that legislation is written. And that's really the goal of Future Forum engaging more young people in the policymaking process, from young members ourselves to young voters and constituents. I'm really grateful to my colleagues who have joined us here this evening, Future Forum Chair Congressman Darren Soto and Future Forum Member and First Vice Chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, Congresswoman Grace Meng. And we'll also hear from Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy and Congressman Andy Kim, who can't join in person, but sent along some remarks. I'm grateful to them and to all of you and to our amazing panelists for being here tonight, because we're going to have an important discussion about another issue that's facing young Americans. And that's the rising trend of anti-Asian bigotry and violence in our country. The violence we have read about in the news and witnessed in our own communities is heartbreaking, it's enraging, and it's unacceptable. I say it's a rising trend, because we have seen more and more accounts of this violence lately, but it's unfortunately not a new problem. We can't rightfully say that these sentiments and this violence against the Asian American and Pacific Islander community is un-American, because prejudice and injustice towards the AAPI community has been written deep into our history books. In the 1880s, President Arthur signed the Chinese Exclusion Act into law, banning Chinese workers from emigrating to the United States. During World War II, the United States government co committed horrific civil rights abuses against Americans of Japanese descent, sending families to live in internment camps in response to the attack of Pearl Harbor and the war that followed. Again and again, throughout American history, our government has itself perpetrated injustices against Asian immigrants and the AAPI community. It's unacceptable. But until we recognize that prejudice and injustice has historically been very American, we won't be able to undo it. And that brings us to why we're here today. Over the past week, I've had a number of conversations with community members and friends, and we're all reeling from the violent attacks in Atlanta where a gunman killed eight people, including six Asian women. We mourn their lives. And we mourn the fact that we aren't even able to properly grieve one tragedy before another happens. These aren't isolated or unprovoked incidents. I'm so grateful that Joe Biden is our president and that we are on a path out of this pandemic. But we all lived through a very dark, difficult four years under a, an American president who openly and cavalierly referred to COVID-19 as the China virus, the Wuhan virus, and the Kung flu and we see what has come of it. All across the country, we have seen a rise in hate crimes committed against members of the AAPI community. Last month, right here in San Diego, a Filipino woman was attacked on the trolley as she was traveling downtown. Today, we're here together to say no more. We have an amazing group of young local leaders who are going to talk about their experiences and the change they're leading here in San Diego and what they're looking for in us, their elected leaders. But before we hear from them, I wanna turn it over to my colleagues to share their perspective on the work of Future Forum, on where we go from here, on what Congress can do to meet this moment. So with that, I want to welcome my colleague and the Future Forum Chair, Congressman Darren Soto. Thank you, Vice Chair Jacobs, uh, for hosting this Future Forum Town Hall tonight. 
as uh, Rep. Jacobs had mentioned, were the youngest members in Congress from the Democratic Caucus, although some are younger than others. Uh, and uh, our purpose is to promote youth engagement. Uh, so we're hosting these town halls across the nation to listen to all of you and to enact policies that address current and future challenges uh, facing young people across our nation. I wanna take a moment to let you know how wise and fortunate you all were to send Sarah Jacobs to Washington. She has a rare combination of key experience and youth. Her experience working with the United Nations, UNICEF, and the US State Department gives her key executive branch experience that many of us are jealous about, by the way, and foreign policy insight that few arrive with in Congress. Yet she's also young enough to understand the challenges facing millennials and Gen Z, as well as the energy to make policy changes happen. She's already been appointed to Speaker Pelosi's Leadership Committee, the Steering and Policy Committee, and is using her foreign relations background on both the Foreign Affairs Committee and the Armed Services Committee, which I know is particularly important for San Diegans with so many service members and veterans living in your community. And she's working on getting service members vaccination rates up, hosting local events like the uh, Veterans Village to explain how the rescue, the American Rescue Plan is going to help San Diegans lives and provide meaningful relief and get our nation back to prosperity. And she's also here tonight focusing on such a key critical youth issue, experiences of the AAPI youth in San Diego. Uh, first, we know Asian Americans are a foundational part of our diverse and democratic nation. They've served in the US military, many for over 200 years, and have contributed to our national progress in countless fields from science to sports, literature to technology and arts and commerce. Despite discrimination, Asian Americans served our war in segregated units with heroic distinction in World War I and World War II, much like the Fagel Tuskegee Airmen, the Burikineers, and the Navajo Wind Talkers. Since then, we've seen Asian Americans serve in both the U.S. House of Representatives, the U.S. Senate, and now the White House uh, with Vice President Kamala Harris. But sadly, the promise of equality, dignity, and respect must be fought for by each generation. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we see Asian American hate crimes have been on the rise. And the recent Atlanta shooting only really raised these concerns even more across our nation. Uh, I'm working with our local Vietnamese and Lao communities uh, and other East Asian communities in Central Florida to address uh, this unacceptable hate. Uh, and Stephanie Murphy, my colleague, is a member of the Vietnamese community in Central Florida. You'll hear a video from her in a little bit. And I was proud to cast my vote for Representative Ming's Asian American Anti-Discrimination Resolution, which she'll talk about in a moment. Lastly, I would say that I serve on the Natural Resources Committee, so I often work with Pacific Islander Americans living in Guam, American Samoa, Northern Mariana Islands, uh, and uh, through uh, other communities throughout the Pacific. And there's a lot of issues we're working on there, from healthcare equity to environmental protection uh, to infrastructure and economic development. And so um, whether it is the issues we're seeing with discrimination against the Asian community, particularly East Asian community, or whether it's the challenges of Pacific Islanders, uh, our fellow Americans uh, in the territories, we're here to work together uh, to make sure to improve all of our country. Uh, and with that, thank you, uh, Representative Jacobs, for having me. Look forward to hearing uh, all of your input. Well, thank you so much, uh, Congressman Soto, for those remarks and, and for your leadership. Uh, next, Jawad from my team will play videos from my colleagues, Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy and Congressman Andy Kim. Congresswoman Murphy is the Chair Emeritus of Future Forum, and she and Congressman Kim both serve as executive board members of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. Jawad? Hi, everyone. This is Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy. I wish Congresswoman Jacobs and I could be in person with you all today to discuss engaging AAPI youth in confronting AAPI discrimination. But I'm glad we can meet virtually to discuss these critical issues. Just within the last month, we've seen two large acts of senseless violence in our country, in both Georgia and Colorado. Of course, my thoughts are with the family and friends of the victims in both cities. In Atlanta, while it's not yet clear what the shooter's motivations were, and we may never really know them, it's hard to deny that this was an attack directed at Asian American women. Unfortunately, attacks against the Asian American community have drastically increased since the start of the pandemic, 
ranging from verbal harassment to violent physical attacks. As the first Vietnamese American woman to be elected to Congress, it makes me sad to see the progress our community has made over the past few decades be eroded because of politics. We must do better. Elected leaders, including some of my own colleagues, need to stop using dangerous rhetoric that is putting a target on the backs of Asian Americans. What we all need to understand is that this language has fueled the increase of threats and attacks against those of Asian descent, and, may, and many Asian Americans continue to live in fear because of it. In the House, we've taken some steps to address this intolerance and discrimination. Recently, we voted on a resolution condemning these violent attacks and hurtful rhetoric. I was heartened to see President Biden strongly denounce it as well. We need responsible leaders across both parties who are willing to do the same. While we need to continue to address the root causes of this hatred, we must also take action to prevent gun violence more broadly. My community in Central Florida is all too familiar with senseless attacks by lone gunmen. In 2016, we experienced the horror of losing 49 innocent lives at the Pulse nightclub shooting. And it breaks my heart to see this continue to be a reality for so many communities across this country. It's time for Congress to take decisive action, and we will not stop fighting until we find solutions. Thank you for being a part of today's town hall and for engaging in these important discussions. Hi, everyone. I'm Congressman Andy Kim from New Jersey. I just wanted to have a chance to speak to all of you about the last week. I'll be honest, it's been really tough. As uh, I learned about the shooting in Atlanta, when I was talking about two baby boys into bed, and I remember feeling the phone uh, buzzing in my phone as I'm kissing them goodnight, and I took out my phone, I just saw a lot of uh, panicked texts from Asian Americans all over the country. People texting me, asking me, what's going on? Did I see this? What, am I, what are we going to do next? And I saw a level of fear in those messages that, I, honestly, I don't think I've ever seen before. People were just feeling very raw and exposed, vulnerable. I did too. I worry about my parents. I worry about my family going out. I worry about where this is heading as a, a, a country right now. What we know is that the, that the racism and the discrimination that the Asian American community has faced, it has preceded COVID, it will exist after COVID. This is a deep cut. Yes, the last year has poured gasoline on the fire, but there are deeper structural problems that we need to address here to understand how we move forward and try to heal. I don't have all the answers. And I think right now, a lot of it is about listening. Wanted to hear from you and others about what it is that you feel right now. What does it, what is it going to take so that you feel safe, that we can all feel safe? This is just about Asian Americans. It's about my communities of color and minority communities, about immigrant communities, but about all of us too. We know we need to build that wide coalition. We know we need to take steps to be able to address this right away. So what happens next? How do we build on that? It starts on this engagement. I heard from a young woman this week who said that she experienced a lot of racism and discrimination. I asked her if she ever reported it before. She said no. What she said was, I didn't do it because I don't think anyone would care. And that was really tough to hear. I could hear in her voice the isolation, the loneliness there, not feeling like anyone cares. We need to make sure that we show that we're engaged, we're listening, but that we're listening not just when it's in the headlines or when it's on the front pages of newspapers, but even when the attention is not there. We need to find a way to sustain this and make sure that we are taking real tangible steps to address it. That's what I want to work with you on. That's what I hope we can all work together on. So with that, I'll let you go and uh, continue your conversation, but I'm, I'm grateful for a few minutes to talk to you about what's on my mind. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Jawad, so much. Uh, I know 
Congresswoman Murphy and Congressman Kim really wanted to join us tonight and I appreciate them sharing those words and their own perspective on this topic. And now I want to turn it over to my colleague Congresswoman Grace Meng, who's both a member of Future Forum and the first vice chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. Congresswoman Meng has been an amazing leader in Congress on addressing injustices and meeting this moment. And she introduced the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act and the Hate Crimes Commission Act of 2021. And you all may have seen her responding to some of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle in a recent hearing. So Congresswoman Meng, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, Congresswoman Jacobs. It sounds so good. Thank you for including me in today's town hall. Um, and I know that Darren already mentioned it, but you are all really lucky to have Representative Jacobs um, as your leader locally in California. Um, Representative Soto mentioned she, in her first few days in being in Congress, impressed Speaker Pelosi and the leadership so much that she is now part of a, a sort of a, a group of members that gets to advise the speaker and gets to weigh in on so many policies that affect uh, all of our communities. And, and I can say that I've seen her in action. She never misses a moment to speak up and to advocate for communities, um, especially those who don't always have a, a, a sufficient voice at the table. She's also one of our newest members of KPAC, which is the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. This is a voluntary group members don't have to join um, and Sarah joined because she is prioritizing the issues of the Asian Pacific American community and as an Asian American I really appreciate her voice and her allyship. Um, to my colleague chairman Darren Soto, that sounds so cool, Darren's nice enough to let me stay in the future forum. Um, I'm older than I look, but he said I can stay for a little bit. So I just want to thank Darren for his leadership. Um, he is so inclusive and really, um, you know, hel helps us all work with each other uh, in a very mutually helpful way and just really appreciate your friendship and your leadership, Darren. Um, look, we come here today like Sarah said, on the heels of two tragedies in our country, yet again, we send our condolences to the families and the loved ones and the communities of those who died in both Atlanta and Boulder, Colorado. Um, and I know that we are gathered here to address this increasing uh, violence and bigotry towards Asian Americans, not just over the last few weeks, but over the last year. And we know that bigotry towards Asian Americans and many communities is not new. It's not a new phenomenon. Donald Trump didn't invent it. But the words that he used when describing coronavirus certainly empowered people um, to be more violent, to discriminate more, and for some even to believe that Asian Americans were responsible for the coronavirus. Um, and so I know it's been a really tough year. And as an Asian American kid growing up in New York, um, I will say that you know, I think all of us can kind of relate to incidents happening to us or people saying something using racial slurs. And I will say my childhood and probably that as many uh, Asian Americans can relate to was that of one where I was taught to uh, mind my own business and to not rock the boat, not to speak up. And that because we were always seen as foreigners that if we kind of blended in and were invisible enough, then, you know, people might think and treat us like we're, we're real Americans. And so right now, I will say that each and every one of you, just by taking the time to be on this Zoom today is really taking a big step. The future of our community and our country is literally in your hands, no pressure. We have often, and I've had lots of difficult conversations with people in my own family and in my own network 
um, we have had to help the older generation or the newer Asian American immigrants understand the importance of speaking out. They didn't grow up like us. And we have been largely silent on many of these issues, um, partly because like Representative Kim said, we didn't think that people would care, um, but also because we didn't think that it would matter if we spoke up. And so right now it is our job to ensure that we are helping and facilitating our community to speak up, not to protect ourselves or themselves, but to prevent these <clears throat> incidents from happening to others in the future. And you all have a tremendously important and vital role in making this happen and, and teaching our community. Um, I had a mom the other day, she, she immigrated here, but she pretty much grew up here. She speaks English, she's comfortable with the culture. Um, and she literally said to me, she said, if something happened to me, like if someone hurled a racial slur at me, I would not know how to respond. I literally do not know what to say. I don't know what to do. And that probably rings true for a lot of our parents or our grandparents' generations. And so it's important that we are next to them, you know, guiding them through this process. Um, <clears throat> You know, for the 3,800 plus report incidents that have been recorded over the last year, two thirds of them are actually women. And so it's really important for us to understand the intersectionality that sexism, racism, you know, that all these different um, isms have with each other and how they impact our community. Um, Darren mentioned the resolution that we passed uh, in Congress last year. It was a simple symbolic resolution that basically just condemned bigotry towards Asians. We did pass it. Um, however, 164 Republicans voted against it. In fact, the leader of the Republican Party from your home state of California actually said that it wasn't an issue that people were talking about at their kitchen tables. And so that's why it's important for each and every one of you uh, and all of us to speak out when these things are happening. You know, in this country, um, I believe that a long-term solution to overcoming a lot of these biases and stereotypes um, are to, is to really have a more complete education uh, teaching of American history and what is American history. Growing up in this country, I didn't learn much about the contributions of Asian Americans um, to our nation. I didn't learn that much about the Chinese uh, building the railroad how Congress passed laws to prevent Chinese from becoming citizens. I think Sarah mentioned some of this before. Japanese incarceration camps barely learned about slaves building the US Capitol, the very place where we work every single day. And so I think long term, the solution has to be making sure that we are overcoming these stereotypes with more education and also opportunities to work together. Um, I'll end with the importance of allyship. When we introduced that resolution a year ago, when not many people outside of the Asian community were even focused on this, um, the leaders of our Congressional Black Caucus, um, Hispanic Caucus, and many leaders in Congress stood with the Asian American community. And I want to say that that is more important than ever. In the last few days and weeks, we've seen national leaders from various communities stick up for our communities. And I wanna make sure that we are seizing that moment to see how much more progress we can make together. I listened to an activist from Northern California the other day, and she said that the answer to racism is never more racism, it's solidarity. That's not necessarily an easy concept for some people in the older and our parents and grandparents generation to grasp. And so it is our job to help um, build that bridge. Um, you know, the Asian American community, our, our muscle of advocacy is not very strong. It needs to be refined. A lot of people in our community don't have the vocabulary to know how to advocate for themselves. 
And we've learned a lot of it from the struggles of people in the Black and Latino community. And so I just want to make sure as we're having these tough conversations with our families and people in our communities that we're leaning on each other and seeing how we can work together to, to help each other's um, communities. So thank you again, Sarah, for having me and thank you for your leadership. I love working with you in Congress and just really proud of the job that you and your whole team are doing. Well, thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman Ming, um, for, for sharing your uh, experiences, um, for telling some hard truths, but also for giving me some hope that uh, things can get better and they are getting better. And, and no pressure, you guys, but we're looking to you. Um, so with that, um, I want to make sure we get to having this really important discussion tonight and that we're not shying away from what's happening because uh, as uh, Congresswoman Ming said, we all need to do a better job of calling this out when we see it, of making sure that we are addressing when we hear communities being disparaged, when we hear our neighbors and friends, and that we name it and we collectively address it. And I'm proud of the work we've already done in the past two months in Congress to address needless violence and keep our communities safe from the Violence Against Women reauthorization to HR 8 and HR 1446, two bipartisan gun violence prevention bills. And I was so proud to support Congresswoman Ming's legislation to study the rise of hate crimes and provide greater oversight of COVID-19 related hate crimes. So with that, I wanna introduce our amazing panelists of young people. Um, I'll start with Nancy Nguyen, the Civic Engagement Community Organizer at PANA. Uh, Brian Hu, the Artistic Director at the Pacific Arts Movement. Andrea Beck, a student filmmaker. Lainey Alfaro, a journalism student at Point Loma Nazarene University and a member of the API Initiative. And Maui Wabe, a student organizer with Voices of the Philam Youth. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. I wanna acknowledge that this is a really difficult topic. And so I'm grateful for you all for being here and being willing to talk so publicly and openly about it. And I also wanna say that this, this is a safe space. So viewers are encouraged to ask your questions. Uh, you can do so either in the chat in Zoom or in the comment section on Facebook. But as you ask your questions, please make sure that you treat one another and our panelists with respect. And I also want to say that I know that it's been a really scary and difficult time for so many of our community members. And I want you all to know that you are not in this alone, that we have your back. We are here. We are listening. We are standing with you and we're ready to help. So with that, I will start with my first question before we get over to the audience questions. And that is, what does this moment mean for you, for your communities? Anti-Asian violence and bigotry isn't new, as, as we've been saying, but does this week or this past year feel different? And how are you as leaders dealing with this uh, within your own communities? And Nancy, we'll start with you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, I, unfortunately, this, this feeling of fear and anger and frustration is, is not new, and it dates back to the 1800s, right, uplifting the 1870s, when Chinese Americans and SF were blamed for smallpox, very reminiscent of Asian Americans in the States being blamed for coronavirus. This dates back to 1875 when the Page Act prohibited Asian women believed to be engaged in prostitution and marked the beginning of policing and criminalization of sex mark, very reminiscent of the man who went on a killing spree um, to attack Asian women because of his, quote, sexual addiction. It dates back to 1923 with the Immigration Act that limited the amount of immigrants from Asia to the US. Um, so, you know, I, I unfortunately, I am sad and I'm frustrated, but I'm not surprised. Um, and I think that this fear has been felt by, by our community and our mothers and our fathers and our grandparents years and years ago. Um, in terms of right now, I think there has been a, a surge in support for, for non-Asian folks. So I, I really feel this sense of being in community and being in solidarity with 
particularly with other communities of color, particularly black people and black women, um, because they also recognize the harm and the fear that comes with being over policed and being over sexualized and, and fetishized. Um, so I think that's what has been had. That is what feels different this week for me um, is a sense of community with with non Asian with non Asian folk. Um, and then in terms of how we're dealing with this as leaders in the community, it's been hard because we are trying to grieve and process and are also expected to, to lead when sometimes that's not what we want to do. We just want to green and mourn and hug each other, excluding the hugs because we can't even do hugs right now. Um, so right now I think leadership is manifesting itself through like collective mourning and being in community with each other. Yeah. Well, I'm sending you a virtual hug. Um, Brian, would you like to, to talk about your experiences and, and how you've been um, meeting this moment? Um, yeah, and, and first of all, thank you again, Karksum and Jacobs for having us on here. Um, I, I feel very lucky that I work with a lot of other Asian American and Pacific Islander folks who, for, for us, like giving each other high fives and hugs is nothing new. Um, it's just kind of taken on a different tenor in the last week or so, in the last year, really. Um, I mean, I'll say this, this is kind of a different way of looking at it. Like, what's really strange for me this last week is getting so many texts and emails from white people, um, like telling me that they're here for me, they, they hear me. Um, and it's really nice, right? Like, these are my peers, these are people I work with. Some, some of these people are, like, are kind of strangers and they're just kind of coming out to work to tell me that they, they, that they see what's going on in the Asian community. But it's really strange. I mean, like Asian Americans have for so long, like been invisible. Like that's part of how we've always been like kind of like we've always been erased from the media, from like from the boardrooms, from from government um, to suddenly get this much attention to is really strange. And so for me, like it just creates another kind of neurosis, which is, is this attention going to disappear? Like the, the new cycle is so short, right? Like that in a, a month from now, a year from now, 10 years from now, uh, what will we have learned from this moment? And, and that's something that that's really kind of weighing upon me. And, and as a leader thinking about how we can create, how we can sustain this conversation beyond it being um, sort of newsworthy right now. Um, and then the other thing kind of tied to this is I'm, I'm, I, I hope that then like our, our white friends and neighbors will also remember to check in on us when it's not tragedy that's befalling us, right? Like. It's not just hear us when when there's tragedy. Hear us when we're making music, right? Like hear hear us when we're expressing joy, and and we I work for a film festival. Like come watch our movies, like see what our see what an Asian American rom com looks like and feels like and cry to that with us, um, and 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 so I hope that this isn't just a way for us to think about Asian Americans as victims, but also as creative people, um, and th those who, who who thrive as any other human being can in the United States. Yeah. Well, definitely count me in for the rom-coms. Um, Lainey, would you like to, to add anything? Definitely. Um, and thank you again for having me as well. I echo the thank yous and the gratitude for, for having us and wanting to hear what we have to say. Um, because youth, youth is the future. And so um, thank you for, for amplifying our voices tonight. For me, I think the experience I've had has just been grief. It's been shock and it's been frustration. It's not new. We all are saying this, it's not new. But I think this is the first time in my lifetime that I've been alive to witness a series of destructive and terrifying hate crimes over this past year. Um, I'm sure they've occurred in my lifetime, but this is the first time I've actually seen and experienced these series of, of, of hate and, and violence. But I think, um, just my blood boils now moving from the from the from the grief and the shock now it's just kind of propelling us into action we can't we can't sit and be sad it's it's too hard to to sit in that grief and that frustration and so now it feels like we have to do something about it you know um and so for me just with how i'm working with my community i've just been trying to email 
local AAIP organizations. Like I mentioned, I'm a, I'm a rising journalist. And so I've just been trying to speak to these organizations, speak to community leaders and amplify their stories and how our communities can be helped through these organizations. Um, I'm trying to include resources in my writing as well. So I'm not just writing about the struggles we're facing. The struggles we're facing are clear. They're being told. So I'm, I'm trying to amplify the resources that, that our community has. Um, and so I think those are the main things that I've just been trying to do. I think telling each other's stories is really important right now. Well, thank you for, for all your work. And, and for those of you who are watching and listening, we'll put some of uh, the resources that Lainey has collected uh, so that, that you all can access it as well. Um, Andrea, do you, do you wanna add anything to this conversation? Yeah, so first, thank you so much for having me. It really like means a lot that we have a platform. And I think the past week has kind of been a breaking point and like a cum accumulation of what the past year has been like growing up racism and just like microaggressions in general against Asian people is something that I think all Asian Americans face and what happened on Tuesday kind of just made it so much more apparent like for me it was really a wake-up call because I think throughout my entire life like because it's so normalized to like face racism as an Asian American, I think I woke up from being desensitized to all of the things that have been going on. And as a leader in my community, I've just been trying to take every opportunity I can to use my platform and raise awareness. I think something that has been really important to me in the past week is just continuing to have conversations and just raising awareness, making sure to check up on people that I know and just making sure people know what's going on, I think has been one of the most impor important parts. Mm -hmm. That's incredibly important. So thank you for doing that. Maui? Thank you so much, Congresswoman, for inviting me today. As a high school student, I would like to thank you for this opportunity. So after what has been going on in our nation, I fear, I fear for the safety of me, my family, and my community. I'm so scared for my loved ones to be alone at public, and I feel like there's been a sense of safety that has been lost. I fear for my community at large. Um, I'm from a town called Mira Mesa, which is a predominantly Asian community in San Diego. Um, I feel like this year has been so much different for me, especially since, um, especially when the pandemic started and with the use of the phrase, our past president uh, used to just to, uh, like to describe um, um, the, our virus. So um, I feel like um, there has been so much hate going on since then, since he used that term. And I'm a part of an organization called Voices of the Filipino American Youth. And to deal with what, is, to deal with what has been going on, um, we've been addressing it through our platforms uh, in our organization. We recently had a virtual women's history event where we felt the need to address what has been going on. Um, though it was a celebratory event, it was discussed in all of our responses during the event and had a big impact on the host and also the guest speakers. Well, thank you. Um, and I love that you can join us and that we can have a range of, of youth leaders here. And my next question, I think, um, ties a little bit to Brian, what you were saying and what some others are, which is, I think a lot of people don't know what to do right now. They want to be good allies, they want to help, um, but they don't know if they're doing the right thing. So I guess it's it's a, a three part question um, for whoever wants to answer. And then actually, Grace, if you uh, have any thoughts as well, like what would you like allies to do? Uh, if there's someone watching who wants to get more involved, is there somewhere you would direct them to? What would it take for you all, in the words of Congresswoman Kim, to, to feel safe? 
And what are you looking for your elected leaders to do? Um, what can we, uh, me and Darren and Grace and, and our colleagues do? And, and Grace, I guess, what would you want your other elected leaders to do with you um, to make sure that, that we are actually using this moment um, and not just letting this, this pass by? Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to all our panelists. You guys are so amazing. I was supposed to run off, but I can't. I can't. I can't hit a leave. I'm so. Uh, <laughs> it's just so meaningful to hear your comments and your feelings. And you know, again, Sarah, thank you for giving um, these folks a platform. I will tell you one thing. I've actually heard from like a lot of staffers who are Asian American, whether on the Hill or in, in other spaces, who may not, like Brian, work with other Asian Americans, or who may not work with people um, who have ever, even in the last year, acknowledged that any of this was happening. So you have an Asian staffer who like is distracted, can't, can't work, is upset, and meanwhile, none of their colleagues have even acknowledged that this is happening. So to find, to just check in with people, well, Asian American people in your network and just to make sure that, you know, it's okay to feel this and just to, to talk about it is very meaningful. Um, and just in general, there's a community led effort on Friday, March 26. It's a community day of action. One of the reasons why this was created um, was especially for that person who may not have ever been engaged before, right? Whether you're Asian or not, maybe you've never participated in a rally, maybe you've never registered to vote. This is an opportunity for you or for you to tell your coworkers, your classmates, you know, post a statement, hashtag stop Asian hate. Um, post a statement in support of the Asian American community and against racism. It's a symbolic one day thing, but we are really hoping that it will start some national conversations and lasting relationships on to how groups can mutually support each other. There's legislation in Congress right now, um, two bills dealing with hate crimes, providing more resources for the community um, that people, if they want, can advocate for. And then lastly, I'll just say, you know, the really hard part, I can talk so easily with all of you about this issue. And, you know, you understand, I understand you. I've been having almost daily conversations with um, Asian Americans who might be older, who might be newer immigrants. And it's really hard to get them to understand like how we advocate and, and, and why things are done a certain way. And then to make sure that they're speaking with other communities um, is also a challenge. So you are a part of all that. Um, and just so proud of you for even being able to talk about solutions like this. Thank you. Um, Brian, I don't want to single you out, but you did mention that the text messages you were getting. Uh, are those helpful? Um, we had another question come in as um, we were uh, asking this, which is from a, another student who's asking how uh, your peers can help make you feel safe, especially on school campuses when, when those are back. And do social media posts from your white peers, like does that help? Does it, how does that feel to you? I don't know if, uh, Brian, I guess I'll single you out since you talked about it. And then if anyone else wants to, wants to jump in. Um, I mean, I, I, like I said before, I'm, I'm deeply grateful to, um, for that kind of validation. Um, validation is not just of our existences, but of our histories. Like um, when, you, when you start hearing white folks talk about what Nancy was talking about, right? The, the histories of like American imperialism in, in, in Asia, like that, that is, uh, it, it feels like things are, are clicking. You know? So that's very exciting. Um, in, in terms of like what our elective officials can do though, um, I mean, I, I think stick like first and foremost, like, I mean, Andrea talked about how we all kind of grew up with these microaggressions and we, we all know how to deal with those. We know how to fend those off, but I, I can't fend off bullets. Like, and I'm, I'm, so if anything, I'm deeply, like if anything scares me and that keeps me up on that, what am I fearful of? It's the fact that um, we have semi-automatic weapons in the streets. Um, I, I, like, like to me, this is like, how do how do we even talk about racism if we're not talking about like the tools of violence that racists employ? Um, that so so that is like something to to our elected officials like that I it, that that to me is tied with racism. Um, 
I mean, I also like to see like assistance, whether it's from our white colleagues, our friends, our social media, but also our elective officials, like support artists, like support Asian American artists, support our cultural organizations. We're the ones who are trying to create the stories that humanize our communities um, to show that we do have desires and dreams and, and, and well, sometimes we're pathetic too. Um, and, and that's like, you know, that's what makes us like anybody else. And without these stories um, and these storytellers, like without like, them being paid really, uh, how, how can that happen? Um, I also like just hearing everyone, what they're saying is a reminder that ethnic studies is important, that Asian American studies is really important. And so like our communities on, this, on the community, like city level, state level, and national level, to like be advocates for ethnic studies is, to me, this is tremendous. And ethnic studies is not just for people who are racial minorities, it's for everybody. Um, and I, I see that when I see these posts from like my white colleagues who are speaking the language of ethnic studies. So that, that to me is, is great. Um, and, and lastly, like, um, we, we, there's so much like war talk, right? Like, like literal wars in North Korea or in China or something, but also like trade wars, cold wars. There's impacts of this on Asian Americans. And we saw that last week um, in Atlanta, right? This kind of discourse around kind of the, the sexualization of, of Asian women, which comes directly out of Asian militarism. How, I, I guess like warmongering is very scary to Asian Americans on a very on a different kind of level. And that, that's also something that I hope that our elected officials think about, and as well as everybody in our communities. Andrea, it seemed like you were moving towards the unmute button, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go over to you. You, um, I think I can answer the question that that came in about what students on campus can do and if social media posts like help. And I think one of the most important parts about fighting and doing something against this racism is being able to call it out when you see it. And I think it starts really young, like at school. Like I talked about microaggressions before, but when, like as an Asian kid, like when you go and you take your lunch to school and people make fun of you for it, or, you know, like you're, like the shape of your eyes will get made fun of, or like even as you get older, the jokes about like the Asian kid not getting a good grade, like all of that, when you hear it, calling it out and making sure that it's not something that will continue, I think is really important because those little parts that Asian Americans face is what ends up contributing to this like bigger idea and bigger racism, bigger I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, but like more racism and a bigger platform for that kind of speech and those kinds of actions. And when it comes to social media, posting is helpful because it does create awareness. And I think what you post is important. Just maybe if you are just posting headlines to raise awareness, that can help, but also knowing to post like the resources that people can use if they do need help and not just posting to post and do some like performative activism. I think that is a problem, but truly believing in what you post and believing that what you post is something that can create change and being able to implement that change in your life and in your community, I think is something that really helps. Thank you. Nancy, I know you're doing a lot of organizing in the community. I don't know if you have thoughts on either what, what allies can do or what you'd like your elected leaders to do or what, what would it take to make you feel safe? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, so in terms of non-elected officials, um, our allies, a lot of things. I think <laughs> you can Google and do your research because we do not carry the labor of educating you um, like you can do your own research for anything that you you want to learn about i really want to uplift what brian said in terms of like not viewing us as victims but rather as like full human beings um, because we've been made invisible and asian women have been like objectified to the point where you can rape kill mutilate us and then get away with it so like viewing us as full human beings means reading our poems, reading our books, watching our movies, 
eating, eating our food, particularly small businesses at this time, um, buying, buying our products, our hair products, our, the things that we, our jewelry, our clothes, um, because we are so much more than like our trauma. Um, and we are trying to survive in a way that like encompasses our, our full humanness. And then in terms of um, elected officials, again, want to like retweet everything Brian said, and also really want to uplift that, that the killing spree that happened in Atlanta was made against women in low wage workforce, um, meaning that they have little to no legal protections or safeguards. And often the people that work in places like massage parlors, like nail salons, etc they tend to have immigrant or refugee backgrounds so there's like this double whammy of like not having any legal protections so i don't want people to think that this violence in atlanta is unique and specific immigrant women that that work in massage parlors sex workers or not face a lot of violence um, on an everyday basis so for my, for my elected officials, I would really love to see support for all low wage worker work, all people that work in low wage workforce, um, and also a lot of decriminalization and protections for sex workers, um, because I think that's really, really important. Um, and I, and I also want to uplift that I don't think legitimizing any form of carceral systems is helpful um, because oftentimes law enforcement has exacerbated the harm that we that we face and that we endure and unfortunately oftentimes particularly if you have an immigrant or undocumented background um, you don't feel comfortable calling police um, because of fear of being deported um, so to not legitimize any type of like law enforcement in our spaces, I think is really, really important and doing that on a policy level um, is really important for our safety. Thank you. Um, and um, Lainey, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit um, and then anyone else who wants to join about if there are certain aspects of this problem that are being ignored or glossed over or stories either positive or negative that you wish were getting more coverage? Um, there's a couple things for me. Um, first of all, I just, it isn't much a story that I want that I don't want glossed over, but it's the need for disaggregated data that I want to advocate for right now. Um, really, if you look at the Asian American grouping, it's Koreans, it's Filipinos, it's Japanese, it's a wide range of different ethnicities. And, and really, I think this way of collecting information about our needs and our situations is not really helping each specific group's problems. It's not that I'm saying one group deserves more help than the other, it's that our needs are unique. Especially um, in, California, in San Diego with the Filipino community being the third largest ethnic group behind white and Hispanic, our needs are different. And so really disaggregated data ultimately helps each group get the care and the support that they need. Um, so first I wanted to advocate for that. And the other thing I wanted to know is just, um, we need justice. Um, that's something I want to highlight. I read in an article from the Washington Post the other day about, about whether the Biden administration will pursue hate crime charges against the shooter in um, Atlanta. And in the article, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote it real quick, a former FBI agent said, prosecutors at times choose to forego um, hate crime charges because they think they would make it more difficult to win a conviction and are not worth the effort. And in reading that, initially I thought, by all means, um, prosecutors do whatever it takes to get the conviction to put these, these horrible people away. But the next thing I thought of is, why are hate car crime charges not worth the effort? That doesn't make sense to me. Hate crime charges should not lessen the chance of a conviction. They should reinforce the, the fact that, that this conviction is needed. So not only in the Asian American Pacific Islander community, but for all minorities in America, being perceived as not worth the effort is, is not okay. And I feel that I would feel safer. Um, and I believe this, this shouldn't be glossed over. Um, so I'm, I'm just calling 
prosecutors or a government also just to to not look over hate crime charges those need to be recognized and and events and violence that that happen like this they need to be recognized as hate crimes thank you maui i know you've been doing a lot of work with uh the filipino youth um i don't know if you have anything to add either about stories that you don't want glossed over or the particular uh needs of the filipino community would love to hear your thoughts so i think there should be more coverage on how communities are working together um i think it would encourage people to support us and what's going on right now but then I also think that the individual stories of the attacks of um, of Asian Americans should be highlighted highlighted as all, um, as well. I thought it wasn't really highlighted in the media, and um, I think that should be there should be justice brought to their um, stories. But I'm very I'm hopeful because I I think it's great that all of this is being being brought to attention. Um, I think. This has been this has been occurring um, with Asians for a while, and I think it's very necessary in our communities to bring attention to it because it does not just affect um, Asian Americans, but it does affect a community at large. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we did have a question come in in the chat, and uh, you know I know it's a tough it's a tough question, so um, we can try and. Um, you know, talk about it um, with each other, but um, there are some some folks who are watching in who are part of a local law enforcement uh, and they want to know if you all feel like law enforcement has been doing enough to ensure safety and educate the community on hate crimes and investigate them. Nancy, I, I know you spoke so eloquently about not wanting to increase um, the carceral state and making sure that we're being in solidarity with uh, all communities. Um, but I suppose if one of you want to answer that question or if there's um, other uh, other suggestions or proposals that you would want um, to help make you feel safe in the, the immediate. No one? Well, I, mean, I guess because August Larson actually um, posted this great thing in, in the chat. Um, it was sent only to the panelists, but I just wanted to echo it so everybody, including the attendees, can see it. But um, Hollaback is this organization that has um, created resources for bystander intervention training. So, um, and, and so, so like a community-led way of, of trying to protect our communities. Um, I, to me, that's, that's very important. Um, in terms of law enforcement, I feel like um, Law enforcement is probably only as good as the laws are, right? Like you're, you're enforcing the law. And if the laws are sort of stacked against our communities, then there's only so much they can do. And there's so much we can really trust them to do, frankly. Um, and so we, we need laws that can actually address hate crimes. <laughs> and, what, and how do we define hate crimes? Because if we don't have, if, we, if, we're, not, if we're defining them in kind of wishy-washy ways or very like hard to prove ways, then what we as People who receive racism know all the time to be racism. If, if that's if it's not possible for that to be adjudicated, then when law enforcement can only do so much. Um, so I'll, I'll just add that to the conversation. Thank Sarah, you. I could add yeah. a, a little bit something on my perspective because I found sort of like, and maybe it's kind of generational to um, a mixed response from the AAPI community. Some want more law enforcement and some don't. I think that the straight up answer of just needing more law enforcement and more hate crime charges is not going to solve the problem in general. We need to take more preventative measures. Um, part of the legislation that we're pushing is to provide more resources to local law enforcement so that they know how to more effectively investigate and more effectively communicate um, with the people on the ground when they're looking into these cases. At the same time, the bills that we're working on also provide for counseling instead of incarceration when someone is convicted of a hate crime. I've heard people in the community say, well, just lock them all up. And I'm like, well, that's not, that's not going to be a, a magical solution when you lock someone up that they're gonna understand better what their prejudices might have been. And a whole nother discussion on the issues of mental health as well. 
Um, but I think that, you know, one thing that is helpful is to make it easier for communities to report these types of incidents um, as well, instead of just straight out asking for more convictions. Um, but, you know, to, to make sure that people are scared to report or people are busy, they have to go, they're on their way to work. They might not under, they might have language obstacles. Um, so just to provide more effective tools locally. And the last part of the legislation is also to provide more resources for community groups. We need to take more preventative measures, more wraparound services for our communities, not just, you know, at the, at the tail end of how this is happening and, and what happens, but our community groups are doing the work that government should be. In the beginning of the pandemic, you know, we were begging, whether it's New York City or whether it's the federal government, just to provide resources in different languages. Like, people didn't know there were quarantine. People didn't know where to get tested. They still don't know where to get vaccines. Um, and so, you know, our community groups have been doing, have been working overtime, and they need more support as well. Thank you. Um, and Darren, I see you have your hand up. And I, uh, as I turn to you, I guess I'll also just ask uh, another question that came in um, that I think, you know, the question of immigration is so tied to both why there, there is this vulnerability and the law enforcement question. Um, and so I was wondering, in addition to what you wanted to answer on this last one, if you want to talk a little bit about what uh, we're doing on immigration reform um, as a Democratic caucus. Thank you, Representative Jacobs. First, uh, you know, Representative Meng gave a great description of the cultural competency that we need in law enforcement. Diversity is another key issue, and being fluent in the languages of a community. Uh, when you're talking about a city like San Diego, where you have a large Anglo, Hispanic, and Asian population, particularly Filipino, there, Filipino, there should be folks from all those communities in law enforcement, and folks who are bilingual. Uh, it would be unheard of in a city like Kissimmee to have no one speaking Spanish in our uh, city uh, police department. We also have a large Central Asian community, predominantly Muslim Americans. So we have several Muslim Americans on our small Kissimmee police department force because the law enforcement, our local police departments need to reflect the communities and that bilingual nature is so key to avoid the miscommunications uh, where issues happen. Uh, with regard to immigration, uh, just over, uh, a week or so ago, we uh, put forward, we usually do a couple letters a month, and one of them was to support the Dream and Promise Act and the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. And uh, the Dream and Promise Act is uh, a bill that will allow uh, dreamers to immediately have an ability to get legal permanent status and apply for citizenship. Uh, I know there's a lot of dreamers in uh, the San Diego and Southern California area. Uh, in addition, it would allow those with temporary protective status uh, to be able to apply for citizenship. I know uh, definitely in sort of Central Asian and Middle Eastern Asian nations, there are several uh, communities with temporary protective status. And, uh, and then finally for farm workers, uh, which are of many different communities, including the Pacific Islander community. And, uh, and so it would allow for even folks who are here um, without lawful papers to be able to have an eight-way pathway to citizenship uh, and legal residency. Uh, which is tremendous as we're trying to make lawful millions of Americans who are American ever since the word other than the fact that the laws are against them right now. Uh, so that could also help with a lot of these scenarios we're talking about where you have immigrant communities who, that don't feel like they could reach out to law enforcement uh, and don't feel they could speak up in the courts and among their elected officials. Uh, all these are uh, great strides in progress that are now in the Senate and we're hoping that they pass them. So I uh, Anybody, not only from California, but across the nation who uh, is watching this, encourage your U.S. Senators to pass the Dream and Promise Act and the work, um, the Farm Workforce Modernization Act, two key priorities of our caucus. Thank you. Um, and Congresswoman Meng had to had to log off, but I, I actually wanted to ask a question similar to, to what she'd been talking about, how some of the conversations that she was having with others in the community um, I know we've gotten some questions coming in from uh, other young people who are of Asian descent who want to know if you have any advice about talking to your own families, um, especially across generations about these issues and how you've been able to, to bridge some of those divides. And 
Um, Maui, I, I, maybe I'll turn to you first as, as our youngest member of the panel. Yes, so I think it's important that we bring up these um, topics to our parents and grandparents. I think um, that is the first step that we can take in our community to address our needs. Um, and little by little, like addressing it at the dinner table or just talking about um, like the microaggressions that we face and how we could um, get rid of those. Um, would be beneficial for our community. Thank you. Lainey? Um, just to add to it, in speaking to maybe your, your, your grandma, your Lola, um, elderly people in your family, just um, I think starting with compassion is important. They had their own whole life um, experiences of, of immigrating to, to the U.S., for my family at least, of experiencing forms of racism that you don't even know about. Um, and so due to the experiences they may have had, it impacts the way they might want to talk about it. So having compassion in this topic, I think is extremely important in speaking with parents and with elderly members, or elderly family members. Um, just have empathy for, for their lifetime and what they've been through. I think that's, that's the main thing I would, I would suggest in starting these conversations. Yeah, that's very helpful. Anyone? Uh, Andrea. Um, like I've been kind of talking about microaggressions this time, but I think as an Asian American who, have, who has parents who may not always understand what those microaggressions may look like, it's kind of scary for me. And I worry for them because they assume the best from people and they just assume that people who, you know, make comments or to say things that Asian Americans growing up would recognize as microaggressions. Like I'm scared that they won't recognize that. And so I think just starting the conversations with them is the most important part. And just being able to tell them about what's going on and really just like talking about it. I think because like my parents, they they were the ones who immigrated to the United States. So just sitting down and talking about their experiences, their immigration, and how that may look like their different generations, I think is really important. If I could just add one other thing, um, it's that maybe, maybe I'm just more cynical, <laughs> but I just feel like my parents and their generation, they're on their own social media, right? They talk to each other on like WeChat and, and Line, and those are also their own bubbles. And so we have to, we're also like, condo like, like communicating with somebody who has their own kind of politics too. And so I would just caution that anytime we speak with our parents, get ready potentially for like that them to bring up things that say, me, look to us like anti-blackness. Because so easily this kind of conversation about protecting Asian people will turn into well, who are our enemies. And we cannot let that happen either. The solidarity as, we, as so many of you have mentioned is vital. That's such an important point. And um, Nancy, I saw you reaching for the unmute button. Did you have something else you wanted to add? Yeah, I was gonna say something in the same, um, similarly in terms of when, when we have conversations with elders about sense of safety, um, sometimes the question, the, the conversation can get anti-Black real quick. Um, and, it's, and it's okay for you to set your boundaries with your family to say, if you're going there, like, I'm not having this conversation, I love you, but we're, <laughs> but this is not the conversation that I want to have. Um, and to like, I think my family in, in particular have like a really hard time expressing emotions. So rather than me asking like how they feel, I would just be like, do you want me to go to the grocery store with you? Do you want me to pump your gas for you? Um, and that can, probably stir up some conversation, but it's also you just showing up for your family. Um, because oftentimes for a lot of like Southeast Asian families, like acts of service is how we show love. Um, and sometimes having conversations is, is not how we how we show love and like that's okay. Um, and, and you can do what is appropriate for you and your family dynamic. Um, yeah. That's really helpful. Um, I know that we probably have a, a lot of 
people listening uh, who uh, are going to use a lot of these tools. Um, so we only have a, a few minutes left and I wanted uh, to make sure that that we all um, that you all get a chance to give some final thoughts or anything that you wish I'd asked um, or answers you had bubbling up that we didn't get to. Um, and I'm going to try and go in the reverse order that we did the openings, um, although I'm not sure I remember what order. So bear with me. Um, but I think, um, Andrea, why don't you go first? Thank you. Um... One thing that I wanted to say is it's really important to acknowledge and celebrate the Asian American identity. And I think so much of Asian American culture and just growing up Asian American is that you don't feel seen and you don't feel like you have a platform. And so to recognize the Asian American experience and everything that comes with that, like our history, like our culture and how diverse Asian Americans are as a community, just recognizing that and showing up for these people and listening to their stories is just so important. And one thing in particular, I guess I wanted to respond to the last question you kind of threw out in the Q&A that was up for everyone, but something that I think is ignored or glossed over, but in media too, recognizing the Asian American experience, especially like what happened last Tuesday, American media, they mentioned that they didn't see any racially motivated, they didn't see it as a racially motivated crime when Korean media and Korean newspapers specifically reported that Korean witness on site said that they heard him say, we need to kill all Asians. And I think the invalidation of Asian American identity is something that like media also co contributes to. So just like Ryan has been mentioning, like show up for our culture, show up for the stories that we have to share. Thank you. Um, Maui, I think you might, I think I'll have you go next. I can't remember the order. So now we're just going in whatever order. Thank you. So I think I just want to emphasize that Solidarity is key, but then with solidarity, it should stem from you genuinely wanting to do it and with love and care. And I think um, with solidarity, there should also be action. Um, and I think this action and solidarity should um, both come from our community, but also our elected leaders too. Um, I think um, we need elected um, leaders and officials to be on the forefront of providing this action. And I think there should be an emphasis on providing education on these topics to the youth um, in our schools because this is the future. And I also think we should um, be providing resources to our community as well um, to help us become more aware. Thank you. Um, Lainey. Just a few things for me. Um, make it a job to educate yourself. It's not I, I can't remember which panelist said it, but it's not your Asian friend's job to tell you, oh, this happened, or um, we're the largest ethnic group in this city. It's not, it's not our job to tell you that. So, so make it intentional. Um, if you really wanna show that you're supporting us, do it through education. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to highlight real quick, a couple organizations in San Diego are doing some really awesome stuff. Asian um, Pacific Islander Initiative is advocating for a Filipino Resource Center in San Diego. Um, and the Philippine Nurses Association of San Diego um, created a vaccination task force. They've vaccinated 3,000 people to date. I just want to encourage you, look up organizations in your city and donate to them or volunteer for them. Um, show up at these places. if to really show your support to, to the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Thank you. Um, Brian. Um, I mean, first of all, like just how, how exciting is it that this, these forums exist and then that all of us can be here to talk in this way. I, I, this is really valuable and I hope that there are more opportunities like this. And Andrea brings up a really good point about the media, right? Like that the media was, was writing about the incident last week in a certain way, right? Sex addiction. Um, but you know who, who stepped up to, to correct that was Asian American journalists, 
we have to listen to and read our Asian American journalists who are on the ground doing the exact same work. So I applaud like Laney and the work that you're doing and all the journalists around the country who, who are like, I don't know how, how did, you, did you all just graduate with Asian American studies or something? Because you knew immediately how to talk to this organically, right? This is fr from your lived lives. So like read, read us, watch our movies. Andrea is like a, is a media maker, like watch how, watch how we are telling our stories. So that, that's, that's where I would, um, that's the last idea that I want to convey. Thank you. Um, I'm very excited to watch some of these movies. I'm going to message you guys after for some recommendations. Um, Nancy. Yes, same. Um, I just want to say, express my deep gratitude, Congresswoman Jacobs, for, for creating a forum like this. Um, like it means a lot to have a platform um, that exists like this when we have been made invisible for so long. Um, and then the last thing I want to leave with is, um, you know, a quote by Audre Lorde, and she says, I am not free while any woman is unfree, even when her shackles are very different from my own. So like we are not free until our, our black brothers and sisters are free, our indigenous brothers and sisters are free, our Latinx brothers and sisters are free, undocumented people, sex workers, etc. Um, and like that what it that's what it means to like be in community with people and to show solidarity um, because we don't operate in our own bubbles. Everything coexists and is interconnected, um, which is why the intersectionality of it all is really, really important. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, Darren, thank you for joining us here tonight. Um, to our panelists, I cannot thank you again for putting yourself out there like this. I know this is a really difficult topic uh, amidst a really difficult time. Uh, and just because I'm a couple years older than you, we're going to pretend it's only a couple. I'm going to just uh, mama bear you a little bit. Remember that you can't pour out of an empty cup. So take the time you need right now, make sure you're prioritizing your own mental health, that you're doing what you need to be able to show up for your community because you're not going to just running yourself ragged. Um, to everyone watching, thank you so much. Um, thank you for engaging and for challenging yourselves and your families and your communities to come together in this moment and to stand with our AAPI community and bring an end to this anti-Asian hatred and violence. If uh, you missed something or you want to share this, we'll have a recording of the event on my Facebook page, facebook.com slash rep Sarah Jacobs. So please share with anyone you think could benefit from the wisdom of these young leaders. Uh, and as always, if there's ever anything that I or my team can do to be a service, please visit sarahjacobs.house.gov or call us at 619-280-5353. Uh, and with that, I will end with a hearty thank you to Darren and Future Forum for helping me set this up uh, and to all of our panelists and to all of you watching. Uh, I'm leaving feeling um, a little bit more hopeful about our future and it's because of the work of all of you. So thank you all again so much and, and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>